John's Gospel, chapter 18, let's begin in verse 12. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, Are you not also one of the man's disciples? One of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest Then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me. And I said to them, indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest? Like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness to of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also are, are you are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Let's pray together. Father, help us now as we look at these things. It's hard for us to read, hard for us to think about. Um, But we're also thankful as we look at these things because we know that all of it was for us. And so we thank you for Jesus' sacrifice. We thank you for what he went through. We know, Lord, that it was because he needed to. In, in order to be able to pay for the sin debt of mankind. So we're thankful for that, having already received that salvation. Lord, those of us that know you, we pray that you would use these ver- verses for your purposes. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we left things uh, with right at when Jesus uh, was betrayed by Judas and and Jesus demonstrating that he was in control. In fact, I listed for you five indications that Jesus was in control during his arrest. You can go back and listen to that on our YouTube channel. Um, but we didn't cover a lot that would hap- was happened right before that in the garden because we're looking at the Gospel of John. And John only mentions what he mentions. Uh, I did reference a few things. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover other details related to the Garden of Gethsemane, what he went through, how the disciples couldn't stay awake, couldn't pray, uh, all these different things. And so John, though, we need to understand, he's covering the deity of Christ. He's focusing on the deity of Christ all through the book. We've seen that as we've gone through verse by verse. He also wants to demonstrate that these things are, those things are true in light of the fact that he's the promised Messiah. And he tells us at the end that these things were written, that we may be, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and so forth. And so he didn't include those types of details because what we looked at last week was that Jesus was in control the entire time. And, and only God could do the things that what happened when they, you know, were drew, you know, drew back and fell to the ground. When he said, I am, he didn't say, I am he, he is not in the original. He said, I am. And they drew back and fell to the ground. So John was focusing on his deity when he wrote what he wrote. And so the entire time Jesus is in control. And, and so we also saw that Jesus, or Peter rather, tried to rescue Jesus. We tried to rescue God in human flesh. Um, and it's a noble attempt, uh, but Jesus didn't need any help. He would have asked for help if he would have needed help. He didn't do that. And, and so we saw that Peter 
most likely was trying to cut off the head of Malchus. Malchus, John knows his name because he's the disciple in the text that says that the, the high priest's house knew him. He knew, he knew of Malchus. Maybe he knew Malchus personally. I don't know. He was very young. He was in his teens. He was a teenager still. And so he, he says all this and, and he tries to cut off the head, most likely, of, of this servant. Peter did. And he actually cut off his right ear instead. And Jesus is forced to do damage control now. It's the last thing he needs at the moment. Oy vey, I need to clean up this mess, you know. And so he, he takes his ear and he puts it, reattaches it uh, to Malchus's head. And he did that supernaturally. And then he also rebuked Peter. He said, put it back, put it back in your sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? It's something, it was his portion. It was his, he'd already worked all that out that night with the father. So today we're going to look at Jesus being taken into custody. We're going to also see that it's the beginning of the sham trials that we're going to see Jesus be a part of uh, that weren't even legitimate. We'll go into that more next week, Lord willing. And also we'll see Peter's three denials. So this was the beginning, starting today, this is the beginning of what was necessary for the culmination of what needed to happen for our redemption. It starts today. And not one thing that happened was unnecessary for this whole plan of redemption to unfold. There was no way that the father was going to let his son that he loved, he said multiple times that he, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's not going to allow anything to happen that wasn't absolutely necessary for this whole plan of redemption to be accomplished. So he's already been involved in lots of agony. And, you know, that earlier that evening, you know, he had agonized and sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. There's a, there's a medical term for it. I don't remember what it is, but your capillaries can excrete blood. Uh, and, and, and that's what happened because of the agony. But now that whole thing of surrender to the Father, because he said, you know, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But there wasn't any other way. And he accepted it. And he said, not by will but thy will be done. So it's settled now. This is going to happen. He is, he's surrendered to the Father's plan. And so we're going to see this unfold. And, and we're, see, we're going to see three things that Jesus let them do as he surrendered to this portion or the Father's cup, as people talk about it. He's going to allow himself to be arrested and bound. And we see that in verse 12. He's going to allow himself to be led away. Verse 13. And he's going to allow himself to be struck in the face, verse 22. So the title of the message this morning is, Creation Begins to Mistreat Its Maker. And just can pause and think about that. And it's the only time where the Creator has come and allowed sinful man to do anything badly or, or negatively to him. So first he allows himself to be arrested and bound. Look at verse 12. It says, Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So I talked about this last week, the detachment of troops, that would be the Roman cohort. That would be up to 600 men. Sometimes people say up to a thousand men. And um, it would be hundreds of men there. And also we're, we're told there that the, there's the captain there. That's a Roman officer overseeing the cohort. And then lastly, in verse 12, we're told an officers of the Jews. That would be the temple guard. The Jews had a temple guard that that oversaw the temple area and, and they enforced their law, their laws that Rome allowed them to enforce. They couldn't do capital punishment, except if someone crossed over from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women as the only exception. They had a sign there that, that said that, and that's the only time they were allowed to engage in capital punishment. It probably never happened or hardly ever happened. I mean, once that happens, once the word gets around, I can't go past this little boundary here. And, and, and so they enforced all these laws. Now, when we think about it, this is God in human flesh. Obviously, Jesus could put, a, put an end to that at any time. He could have stopped it. He's already told Peter that if he wanted to, or, or he could pray to the Father, and, and the Father could provide 12 legions of angels. And that's a lot of angels, but there, it doesn't, wouldn't require a lot of angels because one angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 Egyptians. So angels are very powerful. Angels are more powerful than we realize. 
So they arrested Jesus and they bound him. And again, let's pause here for a moment. He could have stopped this whole thing. Last week I mentioned that he could have just had one person arrest him because he was willing. He said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I can take it up again. This is a volitional, voluntary thing he's cooperating with. And, and they don't need to overpower him or, you know, he, he kind of rebuked him like, am I a criminal that you bring all these weapons and all this? Have I been some great threat? So it's, it's crazy to think about that sinful man arrested and bound Jesus. Because in reality, sinful creation, who, who they're the sinful creation, sinful man, they're the ones that are arrested and bound by unbelief and sin. And uh, they, they're arresting this didn't bound this morally free uh, and unbound God. And, and they're the ones that are bound. They're the ones that are sinful. They're the ones that are enslaved to sin and unbelief. And God allowed them to do that. What, as it's been said, what really bound Jesus was the Father's will. What really bound Jesus was the Father's portion, the Father's cup that he had given to him. What really bound Jesus was the plan of redemption. What arrests Jesus is lost people, sheep without a shepherd. Remember when Jesus was ministering to the woman at the well, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And later on this, this same day, Jesus is going to say it is finished on the cross. That, that's what was driving him. That was what was motivating him. That's what he cared about. That's what mattered to him. But he needed to be physically bound in the sense of fulfilling prophecy. I mean, there's all kinds of types and pictures in the Old Testament. Abraham bound Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. And, 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 and Isaac and Jesus are really the only uh, living sacrifices. They're both cooperating with the sacrifice. And, and that's a great picture there of Isaac cooperating. There also in Psalm 118, a very messianic psalm, we're told in verses 16 or 26 and 27, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. So all of a picture of what Jesus would go through, all of a picture of that Jesus would be bound as the, as the, the land that was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, the sham trial begins in verse 13, where we're told this, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And so we need to understand that there was this whole thing with the high priest, and that you'll, you'll read some places, Annas was the high priest, we see it in our passage, other times it says that Caiaphas was the high priest. So the background for Anna, Annas um, was he was the, the son of Seth. He was from Alexandria, Egypt. We're told all this from historians. Um, and, and Herod the Great invited him to come. And he was the actual real high priest from AD 6 to AD 15. But after that, the Romans started just putting high priests in that fit according to their wishes because they believed that that was the best way that they could influence um, the the, 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 the Roman or the J Jewish people is by having a, the appropriate high priest that they approved of. And so they started switching them out. But the problem is with that is that in Exodus and Numbers, it maintained that the office was for life and the Jews knew that. So some of them didn't acknowledge these new high priests that came in. They only acknowledged the ones that came in through their own volition and left by their own volition. And so Annas was caught up in this whole controversy. Some of the Jews only recognized him and didn't recognize all the other high priests that came after him. He, Annas had five sons that were the high priest at one point or the other, and one grandson that was a high priest. And Caiaphas is his son-in-law. So he, he definitely had a lot of family members that were high priests and, and there. And Caiaphas ruled until the time of Jesus' death in around uh, A.D. 32. And, and also it needs to be said that, the, that he was part of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones that were in power during Jesus' ministry. They're the one, they were the liberals of the day, the, the, the religious liberals. And, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in a lot of things that the Pharisees did. And they were always at odds with each other, but they had the power. The Pharisees had the power at that time. The Talmud 
records, the Jewish Talmud records that Annas had made lots of money from, from all of the money changers and all that whole racket that was all set up through the Sadducees and Annas. And they, they perfected this whole thing to where they just ripped people off when they would travel all these long distances to come to the, pre, to the feasts. There's three mandatory feasts that every male uh, adult Jew was expected to be at. And they would need to come with, with money that was accepted in the temple. They needed to come with sacrifices. So they wouldn't want to come and haul all that with them. They'd want to wait till they got there, but they were being ripped off. That's one of the reasons why Jesus was so upset and cleared out the temple twice, the beginning and end of his ministry, because of what they were doing. And part of that had to do with God's heart for the lost. And I went over this when we were in the beginning part of John, when we looked at this, when that we, we talked about how those money changers and those that had all those animals, they were they were in the court of the Gentiles. They were close to the border of that separation between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women. And so when Jesus is talking, in, in, in part, when Jesus is talking about my house should be called a house of prayer, and, and, and it was a place for the Gentiles to come to seek God. And this is the funny thing, because you look at the, the, the temple mount, and you look at the complex and everything, and you look at how it was all set up, the largest square footage was for Gentiles. But yet they thought that God didn't have a heart for the Gentiles. But yet that's the biggest area in the temple complex for the Gentiles. And that's where the money changers were. And they had this whole racket and Annas was greatly um, proffering from it. In fact, they called it Annas's bazaars. You know what a bazaar is? You know, like a flea market or whatever they would call Annas, Annas's bazaars. So it was, it was a, that, that's kind of the background there. And so that's what kind of a man Annas was. Now in verse 14, we see that it says, now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. You remember that earlier in John, we saw Caiaphas kind of get in a dispute with some of the Jews. Uh, and we're told in John chapter 11, verse 19 to 52, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So when John writes in verse 14, now, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man, he's bringing his readers back to those verses I just read, reminding him that he said that. And so uh, we're told, and it continues in verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, most likely John. Most people believe it's John. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door, outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. So again, this other disciple is most likely John. He refers to himself as another disciple later on during the resurrection. You know, he's trying to be, you know, flying under the radar, not say his name and everything. But there's a reason why we only see in John the name of the, ser the, the servant of the high priest's name. Malchus, because John knew of Malchus. That's why he could say that. He had those connections. And some people believe that Salome, his mother, um, reveals, and you look at different scriptures, and, and there are some, some historians, church historians, very close to the Apostle John's time frame, like in the, the low 100s, that talk about that John's father um, had that you know, connection to the Levitical um, priesthood. And there was relatives that he had that were connected to the priesthood. And that's how he had that relationship. We don't know. We don't know if that's true or not for sure. Um, but he ha whatever it is, he has these connections. He has these relationships. And, he, and he's, he's, I'm not saying he's feeling comfortable there, but he's feeling a lot more comfortable than Peter was. As Peter's the one that took off the ear. And, and I don't know how much, I mean, I'm sure Peter was a shocked and amazed that he put this ear back on Malchus. I mean, that probably shocked him. Talk about making up for your mistake. Um, man, I would be so happy if I were Peter, if that happened. I'm like, oh, he put it back on. So glad. Would he have done that if I got his head off? 
You know, like, <laughs> I don't know. He could have, could have just popped that head back on. I don't, I don't know. But he was a bad shot. Fishermen aren't good swordsmen. I don't know if you know that. They're really good at fishing. Well, it depends on the story you believe. Uh, but, but, the, but they're not so good at sword fighting. And so Peter just was trying to do his best, trying to protect Jesus. Um, didn't do a really good job. And, and you know, and, and, and Jesus compensates graciously for him. So that's probably why Peter is hanging back a little bit. Um, because that other disciple went with Jesus into the courtyard, but Peter stayed back. We're told in verse 16, Peter stood at the door outside. No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'll stay out here. I don't want to necessarily go in there. John, you have all the connections, you know them, but I'm, I'm, I'm staying back here. And then it says the other disciple who was known to the high priest. So, so Annas knew him went out and spoke to her and kept, kept the door and brought Peter in. So he had to bring him in. And, 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 you know, the word known there is interesting too. When you look at it, because it's talking about someone that has a common friend or acquaintance. And, and so they apparently follow the temple guard back to the, the, that, that courtyard. There's going to, they're not supposed to have any trials at night. And there's so many things. We're going to get into it next week. There's so many things that they violate here. It's, it's crazy. It is such a sham trial. Um, it's not even lawful on any stretch whatsoever. And, and Jesus didn't even bring any of that up. He didn't bring any of that up. So he's going to be questioned. Um, but then here's the first denial in verse 17. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. First Denial. Remember, all of this started on, on the, uh, the, in the upper room when he, Peter was talking about kind of in a boastful way and about his, how he's going to stand with Jesus. And he's like, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. And that probably just was the most ridiculous statement as far as Peter was concerned when he heard that from Jesus. Like, what? There's no way that's ever going to happen. See, the problem with Peter, and it's in all of us, is that we have pride and we have self-dependence and we have confidence in ourselves instead of confidence in God. And God's always working to get us to be putting his, our confidence in him and not ourselves. Remember, we've already read where John in John where Jesus said to the disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know what nothing means in the original language? Nothing. It doesn't. Well, it means something, but it doesn't. It means nothing. Um, so it's not. It's not too. It's not. It, it's not super deep. Uh, so that's that's the problem. Peter had all this. Peter needed to be broken. Peter needed to be humbled. You know, and, and the ones that think they're the most ready are usually not the most ready. Usually, they're the least ready. So now it says that that. Verse 18, now the servants and officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, Jerusalem, if you may remember, I mentioned this way a long time ago when we first started the book. When, it's, when all the times we read in Scripture, you read this, they went up to Jerusalem. You'll see that all through the Gospels. They went up to Jerusalem. They're not talking about up like north. They're talking about up like elevation. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. And in the spring, which this was in the spring, this was right at the end of March, beginning of, or this would be like, this is like the very last day of March or the beginning of April there, according to the, you know, when you look at the prophecies and all that, you, you, you can back that up for um, Palm Sunday. And so it's in the spring. It can be very cold there. I've been there in the, in the spring. It can be cold in the mornings. This is really late at night. Um, so he's cold. He's warming himself by the fire. And it says in the high priest, then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And that verse, verse 19, we can skip over, but it's, it's significant. It's significant what he's asking him and why they're supposed to be witnesses. They're supposed to be, not supposed to be at night. There's, you know, there's so many things they're violating, but the question has to do with the disciples and his doctrine. Now as disciple, he's probably asking because there's a reason why they came with all these soldiers. They may have thought, I don't know how dangerous you think fishermen are, <laughs> but they may have thought there might've been this big fight and this big uprising. So they came with overwhelming numbers so that they could put down any type of uprising. 
And remember, the, everybody's thinking that he believes he's a political messiah. He thinks that he's going to rule there. And so they're thinking they've only heard anyone ever want to do that. That's connected to soldiers and building an army and all these things. And, and, and he's not about that at all. So we have to remember, we have to put in what their vision of everybody, the disciples, the, the, the religious leaders, everyone's vision of what they think Jesus' whole mission would be if he were the Messiah. That he's a political slash military Messiah. So he's asking him about his disciples. Will there be an uprising? What will your, will, will your, um, are your disciples planning on doing anything? <laughs> you see how good he was with the sword? <laughs> uh, do you think they were going to be interested in doing anything worth that you have to worry about? You know? So then he asks him about his doctrine and no doubt Annas is trying to trap him in his doctrine. The one that inspired the word of God. They were so concerned about their, their, the Mishnah and all their interpretations of the word of God. They barely ever read the Torah or the Tanakh. They barely ever read the Old Testament. They barely ever read those things. They, they read what rabbis said about them. A lot, a lot, a lot in common today. A lot, of, a lot of people will look at what people write about the Bible and they'll trust in those things instead of actually reading the Bible themselves. You know, everyone's an expert in the Bible. You know that? Everyone knows everything about the Bible. Have you read it? Oh, yeah, I've read it. Oh, really? Because a lot of Christians haven't read it. And you've read it and you're against it? Tell me, what is, what is you know, the book of John about? Well, I mean, the simplest of simplest questions. Uh, I don't know. I don't, you know, because they're just looking at what man says about the Bible. I call something um, now, I, I refer to it as TikTok theology. There's a lot of people that are on TikTok and they get a lot of their theology from TikTok. I wouldn't recommend that. Not good. Don't get your theology from any social media account. Um, you, know, you need to go to the source itself. Now notice Jesus' response in verse 20. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. So he's not saying I haven't taught anything privately. What he's saying is the same thing that I've said publicly, I'm saying privately. Or the same thing I'm saying privately, I've said publicly. There's no two different messages there. He's saying there's no, basically what they're concerned about is, because he's asking about the disciples, he's at, in, the, in the teachings, he's asking about, is there anything that you're saying that would be blasphemous? Is there anything you're saying that's, that's helping people think that there's going to be an uprising? Is there anything that you're saying that would make people think that you're, you're the Messiah? Yes, because I am the Messiah. Uh, but, but he didn't shy away from that. But then he, then he responds in verse 21. He says, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Now, interesting, he doesn't ask to legitimize him being who he is. He doesn't say, ask the man I cleansed that had leprosy. Ask the person that I raised from the dead. You know, he didn't point to the miracles. He pointed to his teaching. He pointed to the legitimacy of the, of the, of the, the Messiah is connected to how he taught the people, how he fed sheep and how he laid down doctrine. That's what he says. Ask them what I said. What I said is stands on its own because it's God's word. At one point he said, my words will outlive the heavens and the earth. The, the heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. When Jesus rose from the dead, when he was walking on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples, they said, we had hoped he was the one. And he says he rebuked them because of the miracles? No. Because of what the women said? No. He rebuked them because he didn't believe all that the Bible, all of word, the word of God had said regarding the Christ and how he should suffer. And then he went over with them all those things. I would love to have been a bird on one of the disciples just listening to, to all of that. We used to say, I wish I had a tape of that. That just shows how dated I am. And some of you, it's eight tracks. So don't just get mad at me for saying tapes. Um, but he's saying, why do you ask me? He's asking, now, I don't think he was rude. I mean, I don't think he was disrespectful. There's one time where the Apostle Paul got slapped for saying something. And, you know, he called the high priest a whitewashed <laughs> And, and they're like, whoa, you speak to the high priest? He says, oh, I didn't know he was a high priest. I apologize. And he, 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 he apologized here. I don't think he was disrespectful. I don't know his tone. We don't know it. 
Then it says in verse 22, And when he had said these things, one of the officers who struck, stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like this? The first blow to the Jehovah in person, the, the, the God in human flesh, the first blow. This has never happened before. This has never happened where sinful man has struck God in any way. The, God is spirit, right? But God came himself in the form of a man and, and he lived among us. He tabernacled among us, among his own people. This had never happened before. The creation slapping the creator. This man will stand before Jesus. Did this man come to know Christ? I don't know. I hope so. Can you imagine if he did receive Christ, his testimony? It would never leave him. Just think about, I slapped Jesus, but he forgave me and he was, he was merciful. That's what he would have been to this man if he would have repented, right? I mean, we did a lot of things against Jesus before we came to know the Lord. He forgave all of it. It's just so personal for us because if we've been slapped ever, I remember as a kid, why do I bring this stuff up? I would say things to try to get people provoked when I was a kid, you know, and see what their response would be. Um, and I, I would, I got slapped a few times from some girls, um, until I learned how to duck. But, um, yeah, you just, you just provoke people. I was always an instigator. I'm sure that you can see that a little bit now, the redeemed version. Um, Judy knows all about this. I've, I've Rick rolled G, uh, Judy so many times, um, sending her these videos that, um, that, that are funny, but I thought they were funny, but just being honoring, you know, just, just, just being, you know, just a little brat. I was a little brother. I was the youngest of seven. I had a lot of siblings to, to harass. That was my entertainment. So that's where I get it. Um, but this man would have just, I'm sure just, just been so sorry to think about that. He slapped the Lord, but what if he didn't come to know the Lord someday? He's going to stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, and to the glory of God the Father. And he's going to stand before the one that he slapped. He's going to be on trial before the one that he slapped in the face. Just imagine, I mean, we're told that Jesus holds all things together by the word of his power. You know, and, and it, even then, he's holding things together in a sense. So, you know, just think about the grace that it would, it would take for the creator to allow his creation to hit him in the face and, and yet not just, I mean, if it were me, I would just dissolve his, every cell in his body instantly. And just, I mean, there are times where God judges people in the old Testament and the new Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, where he doesn't play around, but when it comes to him, you know, in his interaction, all this, and he's going to say, you know, when we get to it, when he's on the cross, and he's saying, it's, it's literally the tense is there when he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It, it's saying that it's happening continuously as they're doing that, as they're, as they're doing what they're doing. He's saying it over and over again, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the heart of grace. That's the heart because God is love. That's who he is. He's love. There's justice. He's just, absolutely. But he is love. And I just can't imagine that to be able to say that you were the guy who struck Jesus, that slapped Jesus. Now, Jesus' response here, verse 23, Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? I didn't say anything evil. I didn't say anything bad. He's speaking the truth, but no one spoke to the high priest that way. No one dared spoke, just, just was in terms of just speaking to them bluntly or directly or not prefacing it with all kinds of platitudes and compliments and buttering up and all these things that people would do just to be able to speak like that to him. He says, why, why did you do that? I, again, if it were me, it would, he would be dissolved. You know, that's just my sinful nature. But now remember, Peter's watching all of this. Peter is seeing all of this. He's learning. He's taking in all of this, what's happening. He's never going to forget. He knows in his mind, he knew later on, decades later, he knew where he, where he was, the angle he was at, how he saw Jesus, any eye contact. You know, a lot of the movies you see Jesus make contact with, with Peter. We're not, 
you know, there's not, there's a little bit of hint towards that, but I mean, he knows everything related to that, but listen to what, 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 um, Peter wrote in first Peter chapter two, verses 20 through 23, he's talking about people that are getting persecuted. He says, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So that's the key. He trusted the Father. In that moment, he trusted the Father. He trusted in the Father's plan. He trusted in all those things. And and, and that's the key for us when we're being persecuted. And it's going to happen in an increasing way. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, we need to trust and put our faith and commit ourselves to him who judges righteously. Because there is a judgment coming. So whatever we think, see, revenge happens when we don't realize that God's going to mete out judgment appropriately. That's when we have to take things in our own hands. We don't trust those things being taken care of by God. That's the problem. That's when we get into trouble. But we can turn the other cheek. That takes supernatural power to do that. We can bless those who, who try to hurt us. That takes supernatural power. We can say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That takes supernatural power as we yield. So God calls us to yield to him as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And at any moment, we can ask God for the power and the strength and the grace and the, the, the virtue from God directly for us to uh, us respond in a godly way. God can give us that. So many times as someone is yelling at me, I am praying for God to give me the grace to respond appropriately. And I'm not saying I've always done it perfectly for sure. But, but that's the, he, has, he has endless resources for us as Christians to respond in a way that brings him glory because we don't have the resources in ourselves. I think we know that, right? We know that we don't have the, you, you know that, I know that. I don't have the resources in myself. I need God's power in that moment to act appropriately. See, God calls all of us as Christians to be in control of the situation related to another human like to, to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. To, we're bringing the kingdom of God wherever we go. And for us to be yielded to him at that moment, to remain in control, to remain the one that's leading in the situation, to be the one that's influencing in the situation, not being influenced. And he, he gives us the fruit of self-control. I wish more churches talked about the fruit of the Spirit and, and the fruit of self-control because we can have that anytime we want. We just have to ask God for it. And we have to obviously have our time devotions, all these things, communing with him every day. But he has that power for us any given time. Now, verse 24, we're told, then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore, they said to him, you are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Second denial. Now, the third the third denial comes in verses um, verse 27, but he says in 26, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who cut Peter's, who, who, whose ear Peter cut off. So Malchus's relative. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again and immediately a rooster crowed. So the entire time that, I mean, Jesus knew the future. He knew all this. And the entire time, Peter is just, I don't know. We'll get to ask him someday. Why did you do that? What was going through your heart and mind at that time? Was it self-preservation? I mean, we, we, we usually assume that and that's probably it. But what was going on? What was going on in your heart and your, your mind? And Jesus, I mean, reveals that Peter is going to go out and weep bitterly. And then we're going to see as we get to John, I believe it's 21, where Jesus restores Peter publicly before the disciples. So gracious of him to do that. So again, Jesus was in complete control. 
This is exactly what he said would happen. And, and, and Peter not only learned in this moment that Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath, he's Lord of the roosters. <laughs> you know, he's, he's Lord of everything. How could he know? How could he know that this was going to happen? I mean, he didn't have to knew, learn this. He, he had already seen Jesus rebuke the wind and the waves. He's seen, he's seen so much. But again, the problem is that Peter had self, um, self-dependence and, and thought there was something in himself powerful enough to keep him doing the things that he was called to do. But he doesn't, didn't have the power. He, didn't, he thought Jesus said, apart, all you guys except Peter, apart from me, you can do nothing. He thought he had the power. He was self, it's a classic example of self-dependence and that's, that's not, that's not going to work as believers. It's not going to work to, we face too many things that are beyond ourselves. We face too many threats and accusations. We didn't even talk about betrayal. We, we, you know, when Jesus went through all this betrayal with Judas, we don't have the, we don't have it in us to properly respond. But the thing is, one of the things that's helped me is remembering that I don't have to respond at that very second. I can pray. I can ask God for help. I can say, excuse me. I need, to re- I need to go away for a minute to gather myself, to get under the control of the Lord again. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to respond in the moment. That's where we get into problems. So he, he's Lord, over the, Lord of the roosters too. And we get into the whole thing of failing God. Peter had to deal with this. Now, Peter still had, had we only received one example of the apostle Peter doing anything that anyone could question. And of course, he was still a man. He's still fallen short of perfection every day. But in terms of what's recorded in scripture, it's in Galatians chapter one, where the apostle Paul said he confronted Peter to his face because he was playing the hypocrite because he was acting as if he was okay or that, that, you know, he had been living like a Gentile in the sense of all these things. But then when, when these, the circumcision came, these religious Jews, he changed he changed. And, and Paul says at the beginning of Galatians chapter one, I confronted him to his face. That's the only time because after this, Peter would, um, you know, we're, we haven't even seen yet in John chapter 20 when he breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. That's when they were regenerated. And then later in Acts chapter two, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit and had the Holy Spirit come upon them. After that, you don't really see a, 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 any major issues there. So Peter had to say, I am not so special. The Lord is special. <laughs> the Lord is, is, is able to help me. You know, we have to have our strength from the Lord every day, every moment. Because I don't know if you notice this, but people push our buttons at the wrong time. Like they have a gift of when do they push our buttons. We're usually at our worst when people push our buttons. So we have to be yielded to him and, and recognize that, that God wants to give us all the power that we need in that moment to respond in a way that would be godly. And we're going we're gonna to mess up at it. We're not going to be perfect with it. It requires us to be um, yielded to him. One writer said, I doubt God can use a man greatly until he has first hurt him deeply. There, there's a pruning and a brokenness that has to happen for us to be used by the Lord. For me, it was <laughs> over a decade of God called me to be a pastor in 1991. I wasn't a pastor till 2003. And there wasn't some great long education thing that I was working on. It was character. It was character. It was, it was spiritual growth. It was so many things that I needed. I thought I was ready way before I was. And God kept showing me, see, see that? <laughs> You're not ready. And, and I would get impatient. And then I would, and, and, but there's so many things that he has to do to break us and prune us because the people that are, are the biggest susceptibility to uh, things and is, are people that are self-dependent and trusting in their own anything to, to be faithful to God. And God's called us to be yielded to him and to trust in him. He's our sufficiency. He's the one that that wants to give us the life every single day to, to live a different kind of life. And he's glad he's happy to do it. He loves to do it, but we have to be yielded to him. So he allowed, he allowed himself to be bound for us. He allowed himself to be led. He was led. 
in, the, in one of those verses. They led him. He allowed that. And he allowed himself to be struck. It was just the beginning. He's going to be struck many times. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to have a crown of thorn put on his head. He's going to have his beard plucked out. He's going to have a whole bunch of things that happen to him. This is just the beginning. It's the beginning of us seeing him yielded to the Father's cup. And, and, and that's a, that should make us love him more. That should make us want to follow him more. That's what makes us want to do anything he wants us to do. And, and there's nothing too small or big that, that we should be uh, motivated to, to do for him because of what he has first done for us. It was all necessary. It was all needed. And, and, he, and, and I just love him for it. I just love the fact that he's so gracious. He deals with Peter so graciously. I can't wait to get to that in chapter 21. But he, he's so patient with us. Don't you love how patient God is? He is so patient. He is patient with me all the time. All the time. I just love him for it. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, even when we're not faithful. Thank you for your love for us, even when we're not loving even when we don't reciprocate, you're so gracious because that's who you are. And we love that you're not trying to be something. It's just who you are. And, and we know that to love you is to know you more and to know you more is to love you. So we thank you for these verses. We thank you that you allowed yourself to go through what you went through for us. We're so grateful as we get to go through it and learn about it and think about it, meditate upon it. We know your spirit's using it in our lives. So thank you. Thank you for these lessons, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you would work these in our hearts the rest of the today as we think about these things. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.